Good evening. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, I am Dr. Faith Elliott Rossing and very pleased that you are all here to uh, learn more about the 10K across the Bay and how it might affect you personally, whether you are a participant or a volunteer or a local business or just a member of the community who's interested in knowing what does that mean to me on November 9th. We are, Queen Anne's County is extremely pleased to uh, have been a partner in this inaugural 10K race and we're looking forward to it being a long-term event for the county because we think that it brings uh, a lot of good things from an economic development standpoint to the county, so we're pleased about that. I have just a couple of questions, though, that I would like to ask, and that is because we've been doing a tremendous push to outreach to the community so that everyone would know uh, that they have an opportunity to participate in this town hall meeting and that the event is actually coming. So. Just by a show of hands, um, did you hear about this meeting through print? Did you read about it? Okay. Did you hear about it on the radio? No? Okay. <laughs> QAC TV? Okay. Either the website or the TV station? Okay. Uh, Facebook? Okay. Twitter? Okay. Uh, I'm looking over there. I've got a cheat sheet over there. An email. Did you receive an email as a part of a group? Okay or an email blast through the chamber? Okay, all right, and signs. Have you seen signs posted anywhere in the local businesses? We've tried to do some outreach through them with face-to-face. -face. Okay, all right, well thank you very much. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to the event owners and that would be Sparrow Rogers and Peter Paris. And it's been my pleasure to work with them for a while now, it seems <laughs> seems like we've known one another for a long time. I'm sure it feels longer than it actually has been. So without further ado, Sparrow and Peter. Thanks, Faith. Hi, everybody. I'm Sparrow Rogers, and one of the two individuals who was obviously uh, loopy enough to think that we could easily bring back an event of this magnitude. So Peter and I are local Eastern Shore residents, and we organize another running festival in St. Michael's, which has a profound impact on our community in terms of the money it raises for charities and the messaging it brings in terms of community collaboration and health and wellness. So after three years of doing that event, we decided that we were gonna reach a little further afield and see if we could do something a little bit bigger so we could have an even bigger impact. And in our world, being Eastern Shore residents, there is no bigger place to send a message than on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. And so what began in December of 2012, if you can believe that, was a process to see if and how we might be able to not only resurrect what used to be known as the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Walk, but to create something new in terms of that resurrection. So the old Bay Bridge Walk was not going to come back online for various reasons. And one of the major reasons was security and another major reason was cost. Most people, uh, from a layman's term, you know, from a layman's perspective, that event was just a free event that happened every year and it was wonderful. From the other's perspective, that was an event that was subsidized by taxpayers. It was a very expensive event then as it is now. And it became, a, it became an event that was no longer sustainable for those reasons. And that's why the event basically was discontinued. It was scheduled for 2007, canceled due to weather, and it never came back online. So when we began the process of trying to bring this event back line, there was a lot of work to do. And there was a lot of risk to take because it was now going to have to come back online with somebody else underwriting the cost of that event. And you're looking at those two people right here. To do that, we needed partnerships at the state level and more importantly at the county level because of the impact that this event would have on the county. And more importantly, when we redesigned this event, our goal was to make it an Eastern Shore event primarily. Meaning that rather than you know, copying the format of previous Bay Bridge walks and having Queen Anne's County as essentially a parking area for all of the fun activities that essentially ended up on the Western Shore, we wanted to turn that around and try to have a big impact here in Queen Anne's County. So as you can tell, it's taken us nearly two years to get from that initial planning through permitting, and all of the planning that's gone into this, which includes monthly planning meetings with all these folks over here, plus a number of other people and agencies, we've worked tremendously hard to put together an event that will be both safe, that will be inspiring, that will have impact on charities in your community as well as the state of Maryland, and hopefully have as minimal an impact as possible on the residents who are not involved in the event. 
So with that, I just want to say how very honored we are to have been given the right to try to bring this event back and how grateful we are for the partnerships that we've developed in Queen Anne's County and also over at the MDTA in the state of Maryland. We simply could not have done it and this event simply could not have come back without the teamwork of all the folks that are up here to answer your questions today. So thank you very much for giving us a shot to bring this back online. We ask you to stay on our team, to understand the hiccups that we have with a first year event, to help us if you can as a volunteer or as a community member. Our goal is to turn this into a massive fundraising event for all the causes and charities in Queen Anne's County and to have economic development that matters to your county year over year. So thank you. Thanks, Kyle. And I, I, I want to just thank all of our public safety partners in Queen Anne's County and the residents of Queen Anne's County for hosting this event. And um, without further ado, I'll introduce Dave McGillivray, who is the race director for Across the Bay 10K and the race director for the Boston Marathon. So thanks. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Sparrow. Anyone here um, run? Raise your hand if you run. Yeah? Anybody walk? <laughs> Anybody party like a rock star? Raise your hand. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored and, and privileged to, to be here. I've, um, I've directed over 1,000 races um, all over the world in the last 32 years um, since I got involved in this industry. And um, I must admit that it's really exciting um, and challenging to be involved in this uh, first time event, at least for us. So um, thank you, uh, Peter and Sparrow, for um, having the faith and trust in, in, in the team to, to bring us in and, and help you out with this. Um, I've always felt that the most important aspect to ensure a successful event, bar none, is community support. And the support we've received all year round um, locally has been absolutely outstanding. Again, having directed so many races all over the country, all over the world, it doesn't always happen that way. But here, it has. And that singularly is what's going to make this event very, very successful. Um, even though for years the bridge has experienced the, the walk and the smaller, smaller run, for us, um, this is a, a brand new event with certainly many interesting challenges, whether it's you know, the parking situation, the transportation, no cups on the bridge, um, no bags. I mean, so many different nuances that we're sensitive to and aware of. It's not just fire the gun and they go and, and that's it. There's just an awful lot of, um, a lot of challenges involved in this event that I personally even haven't experienced in many other races that I've directed over the years. So when Peter, and Sparrow contacted me about a year and a half ago. My initial reaction is, so how difficult can it be to put on a 10K over a bridge that three quarters of the distance is, is the bridge itself? You know, you don't need a lot of directional volunteers for something like that, right? Um, but I was wrong. I was sort of wrong. Um, it is, has been difficult. It really has. Um, but the team has really addressed all these different challenges, and I think we're poised well to to pull off a, a quality event in a, f in a few weeks. Um, very, very unique, very, very different, but um, I think that's why 20,000 people you know, register for it. That's not normal. I mean, normally when you create a first time event, a 10K or a half marathon, you might get a couple of thousand people. This event got 20,000. I mean, that's the, a testament to the community, to the spirit, to the excitement, to the organizers, to the support. Um, that all is a big part of why so many people want to be a part of this, um, part of this event. Again, I want to thank um, uh, mainly the public safety agencies and all the other organizations who have um, put in countless hours into the planning of this event. A, a real lot of work truly has gone into this. A lot of times it goes on behind the scenes. You don't really see it until it, until it happens, but it just, doesn't, it just doesn't fall out of the sky. So, um, and personally with Gordy, I wanna say thank you. I mean, he's, he's in charge of the bridge for the most part and we've worked hand in hand with him and you know, haven't really put on too many races over, over bridges before. So we really need to have someone who's experienced with with everything that goes on on a bridge, and, and he's been a, a tremendous, tremendous um, supporter and person who has really guided us along the way. And, 
and Sean Ryan's going to come up in a minute. Sean's from Green Bay. Um, we don't hold that against him, but uh, um, he, yeah, you can tell I'm from Boston with my accent, I'm sure. Um, but Sean's a senior event manager, so he really has managed all the logistics and the technical aspects of this event. Um, Sean and I work on a race in Green Bay, ironically 10K, ironically 20,000 people. So we have a little bit of experience with that magnitude, if you will. But again, this, this is different. And whereas a lot of work and planning has gone into this event, I'm sure, and I'm just saying this, I'm sure it won't be flawless or perfect because, you know, no event ever, ever truly is. Um, but we'll get close. We'll get real close. We are doing our best to ensure a safe, number one, safe, fun, and well-managed well event. And the way I look at it is everyone in this room, I don't obviously know most of you, but we're a team. In order for this thing to go well, we have to do it as a team. We have to make that commitment that we're going to make this work for this community and for those people who have committed to participate in it. We want to make sure that they're all safe and they all have a good time. So we also know the challenges an event like this can have on the local community and all the vehicular traffic and that travels over the bridge and within the surrounding communities. So we're doing our best to minimize any inconvenience and in particular to eliminate the element of surprise. That's really what gets people more than anything else. Not that you shut down their, their street or they can't get out of their driveway, is if they didn't know it and they were ready to go to go to Sunday Mass or go somewhere else and they didn't know that something was happening that effectively paralyzed them in terms of being able to get around. So the more we can get the word out to the community about the event and when the roads are affected, then, um, then the better it is for, for everyone involved. So we're always anxious to get the first year event done so we can learn from it and have a year to make improvements and address any unforeseen issues. Um, so the excitement certainly is building. Um, this is a celebration of health and of fitness and of giving back too. These events, trust me, have been doing it for so long. They really are an amazing events that can do so much for a community. It's, it's funny because years ago when people used to ask me what I did for a living, I used to say I'm a <clears throat> race director. And they said, what? <clears throat> race director. I would mumble, I'm a race director. Embarrassingly, you're a race director? My sister's a social worker, my other sister's a nurse, my brother works for the blind, and Dave's a race director. You know, what do you do? Chalk mark in the road, yell go, give him a bowl of beef stew and tell him to go home. And back then, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it was. You know, now when people say to me, what do I do for a living? I say I help raise the level of self-esteem and self-confidence of tens of thousands of people in America. <laughs> because that's what these things do. They really do. If you're not a runner, you might not have that level of appreciation. But it's amazing how these events transform people's lives in a good way. They make people feel good about themselves, and there's nothing more important in any of our lives than to feel good about yourself, because when you do, then you can help other people, and that's what we're trying to do with this particular event. Again, I have folks from, from Boston, from the Boston Marathon, Larry Murphy, who handles our transportation, Chris Trianos, who handles our uh, medical program, and Matt West, who um, is sort of my assistant race director in the Boston Marathon. A lot of experience um, involved in, in putting on events. So, and as you all know, we experienced a very difficult tragedy last year in 2013 with the bombings in Boston, and we all went through that ordeal. Thank goodness for our public safety partners and people like the public safety people in this room. They got us through it. We had to process it first, and then we had to recover, and then we had to heal. And we put on the, the race this year in 2014. We would not be denied our running freedom. And these people did this, and they did it to the wrong group. And we recovered, and we had a great race, and American won the race. So everything's on the, on the right track, and, and, and everything's teed up to put on a great race um, here over the, over the Bay Bridge. So, what I'd like to do is um, now have Sean Ryan come on up and detail some of the logistics of this complex event, and then we'll all uh, you know, make ourselves available to answer any questions. But again, I just want to say to all of you, um, it, it, it really hasn't been easy. We, we need your patience with us. We, we honestly are trying our best to um, not put out fires. 
We want to prevent fires. In other words, we want to have vision. The genius is seeing it in the seed. We're trying to visualize this thing up front and then pull off a great event. It, again, it won't be perfect, but please know we're, we're doing our best. We're trying really, really hard to, to make this work for everyone involved, not just the runners, but the community at large. Thank you very much, Sean Ryan. All right. Thank you, Dave. Um, as you can tell, I don't have a Boston accent. I am from the Midwest, and I am a Packer fan, but hopefully you don't hold that against me. Um, I cheer for the Ravens when they're not playing the Packers. Um, so here's, here's the goal. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Rossing for gathering us all together. I want to thank representatives from the various public safety agencies, both for your help in the planning process, which has been very extensive. You know, we've been having meetings every month since I think last October with very few lapses. So the amount of hours that have gone into this from over 20 different public safety agencies, we have 65 people on our public safety committee. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to the representatives from the public safety agencies, the MDTA, Gordy, and everybody else for all the countless hours, effort, and work that they put into this. Because as Dave said, it's not as easy as we thought. A lot of times putting on a 10K you know, you say, well, you know, let's have a 10K that starts at A and, and ends here in this park, or it starts at A and ends at B, and now let's go figure out where we're going to send these runners. This event was the opposite. This event, we had a course. We had to figure out the logistics of start and finish. And when you're a race organizer, you face a lot of challenges because it's not just about satisfying the runners. It's not just about satisfying the public safety agencies. Uh, it's also about satisfying the residents because any decision you make that overly benefits one group or another can have disastrous effects on the other. So there has to be limitations. And a lot of the decisions we made, you know, hopefully will become clear as I explain the meat and potatoes of, of what's going to go on. And you'll see the logic behind what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's not all just to tickle and delight 20,000 runners. A lot of it is governed towards safety which as Dave said is always our first and foremost concern, but also to try to minimize the disruption because admittedly, any time you put on an event that affects public roads, it's gonna be somewhat disruptive to the normal traffic patterns and the day-to-day -day lifestyles of the residents in that area. So hopefully, you know, what we're doing will have, will minimize that disruption with this event. So what I'm gonna do is take you through a nuts and bolts overview of the event, and then we'll open for Q&A. When we open for Q&A, because they're uh, doing this on QAC TV, we would ask that you come to the front to the microphone and ask the question. I'll repeat it, and then uh, if it's specific to a certain department, um, I'll probably call or refer someone from that department to come up and answer it. I have a lot of the answers, but I don't pretend to speak on behalf of all the various public safety agencies. So with that said, let me take you through this. Um, first of all, the course route. Uh, many of you are probably already familiar with it, but I want to make sure to touch on everything. So this is the course route. We're going to be starting over here on the western shore at Northrop Grumman. The runners are going to go up onto the bridge and travel eastbound on the eastbound span across the bridge. They're going to exit through Bay Bridge Marina by Hemingways onto Pier 1 Road, and then they're going to be coming up Route 8 and finishing in the Chesapeake Bay Business Park. The start area is going to look like this. This is an aerial view of Northrop Grumman. Buses are going to be coming in throughout the morning, and I'll explain how that's going to work in just a bit. But buses will be coming in in waves throughout the morning, uh, beginning in the early morning hours after 6 a.m., dropping off uh, the runners. The buses will drop off the runners, who will then make their way around the backside of Northrop Grumman. We'll have shelter back there for them. We'll have fluids, uh, and they'll be called out in waves. You know, there's no way to send 20,000 people simultaneously across a 26-foot wide bridge. Although Dave does it in Hopkinton with a Boston Marathon, but it's not a bridge. So we're going to send them in waves, and I'll show you the schedule in just a little bit. But they'll be called out in waves of about 2,000 and sent out across the property and up onto the bridge. So they'll be going on this little road here. Many of you think of it as a frontage road. Its real name is Ferry Slip Road, Old Ferry Slip Road. And they'll be coming out and doing a, a arcing turn onto the bridge and running eastbound all the way across. And when they come down on the eastern shore before the crossover, there'll be barricades that guide them down across the old wooden footbridge and into the marina property. And as you can see, the contraflow traffic on the other bridge, the normally westbound span, 
will route back onto the eastbound span just beyond them. So at no point will we have runners and motor vehicle traffic right next to each other. So a lot of thoughts and concerns going into trying to make sure that we put this on as safely as we can, minimizing the interaction between motor vehicles and participants. The residents uh, will exit across, as I said, this old wooden footbridge. That's actually the old wooden footbridge that was used for the start of the old Bay Bridge Walk, which many of you are familiar with. So they'll exit across that footbridge and onto the marina property, and then they'll go down onto the new Pier 1 road. The, the road is now reopened. If you haven't been down there, the new road is opened. Um, and they'll be going on the new section of the road and down to Route 8. And when they come onto the road, they'll have full use of the marina when they get off the footbridge. But when they uh, go past it and they get to the driveway to Hemingway's right there, we're going to have cones dividing that road. The new road is pretty wide. It's 34 feet wide. So the nice thing is it allows us to safely subdivide the road. The runners are only going to need about 10 feet on the northern part of the road because by this point they'll have gone five miles so they're safely spread out. So they're gonna just have 10 feet coned off on the northern side of Pier 1 Road. The other 26 feet or 24 feet will be split into two 12 foot lanes, one in and one out. So the nice thing is at no point is Pier 1 Road shut down. Uh, the operators of Bay Bridge Marina and Hemingways want to stay open that day. They're hoping to get some spectators, plus they have normal day to day business. So they'll be able to stay open on Pier 1 Road. Uh, the runners then come down along Pier 1 Road on the new section, which will continue to be subdivided all the way to Route 8. They then swing onto Route 8 right here, uh, right where Thompson Creek Road hits, and they'll be coned off to the left side of the road. So the nice thing is northbound Route 8 will continue to remain open all day long. So the northern side of the road will be completely unaffected. The southbound side of the road will be narrowed to one or two lanes, uh, through most sections for the roughly quarter mile from Pier 1 Road all the way north up to Chesapeake Bay Park. The major effects of that, obviously the eastbound off-ramp for US 50 will be shut down and that'll necessitate a detour. And the westbound on-ramp onto US 50 westbound will also be shut down. So that will also necessitate a detour, which I'll show you in just a minute. And the runners will continue going northbound in a coned traffic lane. So they'll have vehicles flowing on the right side, so southbound traffic will remain open. They'll be running northbound in the westernmost lane. Uh, we're gonna keep the shoulder open, but they'll be running northbound, and then they'll turn right at 18 or Main Street here, Stevensville, they'll turn left into Chesapeake Bay Business Park, or Terrapin Park, as some call it. When they turn in off of Route 8, uh, this driveway, which is Skipjack Parkway, will be closed to motor vehicle traffic. The other access point in and out of the industrial park will be open all day long for the vehicles getting in and out. Uh, the disruption to the business park won't start on the roads until Saturday with the setup of the finish area. Runners will cross through, across the finish line, you see a little yellow line right there. They'll go past the medical tents, hopefully. Um, <laughs> if they're having a bad day, then some of the folks from Queen Anne's County EMS and our medical coordinator, Chris Tran, will be there to help them. But assuming they're having a good day, they continue on down the road and eventually turn into this post-race party area. So the green space right at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay Park is our post-race uh, festival zone, uh, whatever you want to call it. And you know we'll have vendors there with food and beverages. There'll be a stage. Paul Reed Smith Band is playing. Um, they've got a lot of sponsorship from Kelly Distributing and Anheuser-Busch, so there'll be um, a Michelob Ultra Dome, a big inflatable dome, there'll be a Build-A-Bar, and so it'll be a fun festive area to come down if it's a beautiful day, you know, and you especially if you have friends or family participating, a great opportunity to come down, watch, clap, and cheer. There will be spectator viewing over here so you can see people cross the finish, and then the festival zone out here with food, beverage, merchandise. Um, beer, soda, and what have you. And then eventually the runners will exit up here on the right corner and we'll have shuttles looping around the business park all throughout the morning to pick them up and take them back to wherever they, they started from. And I'll show you what the transportation plan is all about in just a second. The detours that I mentioned, um, and I apologize, this is um, an engineer's drawing. I'm not an engineer, but this is how engineers look at things from a safety standpoint. So basically, 
you know, what this is, is it's telling you that the cars that are coming eastbound on 50 are going to be detoured onto Thompson Creek Road to get onto Route 8. So if you're eastbound on 50 that day, you'll see the detour saying that the eastbound off-ramp is closed and you're going to have to exit onto Thompson Creek Road and double back to get onto north or southbound Route 8. But that detour will be marked with signs and clearly visible. Um, more signage for the westbound 50 detour. Lots of letters here, but basically what all these signs are telling you is that with the westbound off-ramp not accessible because the runners are blocking it, the, the way to get onto westbound 50 that day is to go on 18 or Main Street through Stevensville and out to Castle Marina Way. And Castle Marina Way, uh, east of Stevensville here, is going to be the new access point for the duration of the morning. And I'll give you the timeline of when that's going to be taking place. Hopefully what that'll be doing too is bringing you behind any of the backup. Um, and yeah, it's going to slow things down to have the northern span divided into contraflow traffic. Um, but hopefully, you know, it doesn't come to a grinding standstill and continues to flow throughout the morning and we don't see significant backups throughout the day. The transportation plan, uh, this map is available on the event website. The yellow boxes are designated parking lots for the participants. The green boxes are designated lots for spectators. There's three locations on the western shore for the participants, Navy Marine Corps Stadium, the Harry Truman Park and Ride, and Anne Arundel Community College. On the eastern shore, we're using Kent Nero Center and Chesapeake College. The reason we chose those locations and the numbers and the number of parking spots available at each, um, in a nutshell, if you step back and you look at it, the goal is this. We're trying to avoid our own participants having any need to drive their own personal vehicle across the bridge to or from this event. Because obviously this event is going to be a burden on the traffic patterns on the bridge that day. To the extent that we can get all of our own audience to use a bus from one of those lots, we're hopefully going to reduce the negative impact of the event in doing so. You know, another way to look at it is to say if we had put designated parking in the Chesapeake Bay Business Park, then 20,000 people would have tried to park there and take a bus to the start line. And that would have never worked for this community or for the Chesapeake Business Park or for us to get the race off and over in a timely fashion. So that's the main thrust of that parking plan. We do have spectator parking. We know that the spectators are gonna to wanna to park in proximity. So there are some accommodations over there. We've got Ken Island High School, Thompson Creek Park and Ride, and Mattapique designated. That will create some traffic from our own audience to the extent that spouses, friends, family, and loved ones are gonna pick them up. Um, you know, at the finish, they'll take a shuttle back to one of those spots and then return home. But the reality you find out with a 10K is it's not like a marathon. If there's a family participating in a 10K, oftentimes they're all participating. So the incidence of spectating is not as high for an event like this. So hopefully the spectator traffic plans don't create too much of a burden either. But in a nutshell, this is this is our model, which is to try to disperse the traffic patterns. The, the challenging thing for us, too, is if you look at that, you've got eight parking lots. And, you know, that's a lot of traffic flows. That's a lot of school buses. We have uh, almost 300 school buses that will be making shuttle runs throughout the day. It's unfortunate that there wasn't one singular massive parking lot out of the flow of traffic on the eastern shore and another one on the western shore, but there just isn't. Um, and even if we had said, well, maybe we'll just use Navy Marine Corps Stadium, well, then we would have shut down Annapolis. And so we're trying to disperse our own traffic. We're trying to be mindful of the community and the residents and the roads and get as many of our own participants to a lot that's close to them and not tie up all of the local roads. The schedule of when those shuttles are running, when everything else is taking place, and when the road closures are going to happen, and this will be available on the website too, at about 2 a.m., or by 2 a.m., contraflow traffic should be established on the westbound uh, span, the northern span of the Bay Bridge. The eastbound span should be closed by 2 a.m. From 3 a.m. till 6 a.m., 
The Bay Bridge police will be screening our own vehicles, our own vendors, our own staff to allow them to go up on the bridge to set up traffic control devices, fluid stations, there will be fluids on the bridge for the runners, porta potties and medical support. So lots of setup, lots of screening. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're doing it as safe as we can. And from four to six, the Route 8 detour should begin, so in the early morning hours. We're ho hoping to get all that done by six, so that at six o'clock, when we start picking up the runners at the parking areas I just detailed, we're ready to go on the bridge. So if they leave at six, we're expecting our participants to begin arriving to Northrop Grumman by 6.30 in the morning. And from seven until 9.30, we're gonna be sending participants off. So again, we can't send 20,000 people all at once across the Bay Bridge. Bad things could happen. It's a very high bridge. People are gonna be daunted as it is. So to keep things safe and manageable, we're sending them across in waves about every 15 minutes. This is the schedule of the waves. So you can see there's actually 11 waves because we have, we have a wave right at seven for the people with disabilities. So wheelchair racers and other people with disabilities will be going off at seven. A group called Athletes Serving Athletes, which is able-bodied runners pushing disabled folks is gonna be going across. They're all starting at seven. The, the other waves begin at 7.15 and in an ideal world, all the runners go off from fastest to slowest. Now, it's not an ideal world, so that never happens, and I'm sure we'll have walkers mixed in at the beginning, but we do the best we can, and we let the, them tell us what their pace is gonna be, and we try to seed them according to that, because if you let them go from fastest to slowest, it makes the whole thing go faster. So they're gonna be going off by 9.30. If we're on schedule, we've got all of the waves off and running, and then at 7.30, we'll have our first participants crossing the finish line and arriving in Queen Anne's County. At 9.30, the last wave of runners will start, and based on typical average paces, even for the slowest of our walkers, we're expecting the last participants to exit the bridge by noon. We're allowing for a possible window of about two hours for course cleanup and equipment removal. Now, we may have more ambitious internal goals than that, but we're committing that by two o'clock we can get all of that done. So, in a nutshell, you're looking at a 12-hour window from 2 a.m till 2 p.m. So 12 hours uh, that this will be affecting the Bay Bridge. At 2 p.m., the eastbound span or earlier will reopen to motor vehicle traffic. Just a couple other things to touch on before we open for Q&A. Uh, environmental concerns, we've asked, been asked by some groups, environmental groups in particular in the Chesapeake Bay area, you know, are you being environmentally mindful? This is a green event. Uh, Dave mentioned no cups. We are doing a cup-free race, which is a foreign concept to most runners. This will actually be the largest cup-free only race in the world, in history. Other races, larger races, have offered it as an option for runners to carry their own containers, but by and large, most of them, when they get, are given the option, will take a paper cup, crumple it up, and throw it on the ground. It was raised very early on by the MDTA that we wanted to be environmentally mindful, and we didn't want to have cups being thrown onto the bridge because it's windy up there and we all know where they'd end up, right in the Chesapeake Bay. So it was a real challenge for us of how to do this, but we're doing it. We're also working with Annapolis Green and Bay Area Disposal at the start and finish areas. This is what it'll look like to the runners up on the bridge. We're gonna have these large blue tanks called water monsters, not like a sea serpent water monster, but a giant water monster tank. They hold 125 gallons each and they're connected to these PVC manifolds that have uh, what are called hydropore valves, they're high flow valves. And the runners have been notified and they'll be continue to be notified that they need to bring their own containers. And some of them wear fancy little things called fuel belts or they'll do a handheld container. Um, some of them will just run with a bike bottle. And some of them will say it's 6.2 miles, I don't even need fluids for that far, especially when it's cool in November and they won't even bother. But we will not have cups and we will not be allowing our participants to litter the Chesapeake Bay. Um, again, we are working with Annapolis Green to be a responsible event, and we will have trash and recycling at the start and the finish, not just at the finish, but at the start and the finish. Our charity partners, those who are helping to staff the event, include Bosom Buddies, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Team in Training, which is the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and the Yellow Ribbon Fund. And volunteers are still needed 
And as long as we have an audience here, we're trying to get word out. There is always a last minute push the last two weeks before an event. There's always positions available. If you go to bridgerace.com and you click on volunteers, you can uh, find an online menu of what positions are still unfilled. So you can find one that matches your interest, your schedule, and sign up. And we'd love for all of you to sign up and help us out if you're not participating or if you're not signed up to volunteer already. And with that, I'll say thank you for listening. And I will open up our team for questions. Thank you. All right, anyone who doesn't ask a question has to run it. Any, no any questions for the, from the group? Yeah, can you do the, you just use the mic so we get a record of it. Is, uh, is this date set in stone, or is there a chance that next year it may be modified to a different date? Yeah, the question is, uh, is the date set in stone? Um, I would defer to maybe Peter and Gordy on this. Um, and you can maybe speak to why it's in November this year versus the old Bay Bridge, which is in May. So the question is, is the date set in stone, and could it change? Peter, do you want to? Or Sparrow? So the question about the event date. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we faced as far as a challenge in bringing the event back is that the old Bay Bridge Walk was the first weekend in May. And if you can imagine the traffic that would have created um, for all of us, that would have been, been quite the hurdle. So we actually sat down and went through a very thoughtful process to find a date that we felt the weather was going to be safe and accessible in terms of, in terms of temperature and also storm patterns. But we did a deep analysis of traffic volumes on the bridge to make sure we had as limited an impact as possible. That landed us in November. And we would like to keep it in November right around the same date going forward. We are a little bit uh, bound in terms of, of that particular scheduling because we rely on the Naval Academy to do all of our packet pickup. As you can imagine, we have 20,000 people the first year who need to come in in a two-day period to pick up their race shirts, their race bibs, and all of that other stuff that they need to get before a race. There just wasn't a facility over here that would accommodate that volume of people, and we ended up landing with the, Naval, uh, the, Navy, the Navy Marine Corps Stadium. And so we're, they, because, of course, this always happens with, a, with an event. They decided to switch leagues this year, and so the Navy switched football leagues, and so they don't know their 2015 dates yet. So what I would say is that we are shooting to have it right around the same time every year, but we're not exactly sure of the date. And, and that actually brings up just a, a further clarification. Queen Anne's County has entered into a partnership with ourselves and the MDTA for a multi-year agreement. So this is not the only race that's planned. We do have at least three events you know, that, we are, that we've agreed to produce from now until, um, until 2016. And we'll talk about making it a much longer term, assuming that we can get through it without too many disruptions. Other questions? Your planning seems to be very thorough, thorough, so I'm sure you've already checked into this, but I'm wondering what, if any, events are scheduled in Ocean City, Maryland that weekend? Um, the question is, what, if any, events are scheduled in Ocean City, Maryland on the same weekend? Uh, Sparrow, I'm not sure of any. Are you aware of any events that particular weekend? much of a runner, but I get my workout talking. Um, we actually did a statewide analysis of every major event that was taking place. Everything from concerts to running events to festivals, including waterfowl, which is taking place in Talbot County. And so we worked very hard with all of the jurisdictions up and down the shore to make sure that we wouldn't be disruptive. With that said, there was no major event planned in Ocean City when we scheduled this event. I can't say that they've contacted us to let us know if they've changed that planning. Is there an event we're not aware of? <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, Jamie Rowell with uh, Ultimate Performance Lacrosse. We have a tournament okay. starting the same weekend as the race at Central Sod Farms with uh, 20 fields per day with teams from throughout the United States and Canada. Our games start at 9 in the morning, end at 3 in the afternoon. So the afternoon seems not to be an issue. Our concern is the coaches, uh, the teams that are staying on the other side of the bridge getting here by 8 o'clock in the morning and what the anticipated delays will be for traffic so that we can warn referees, trainers, give teams a head up of, hey, 
they usually show up an hour before the game. So they start at 9, and then we have the 10 o'clock games that go off. So this is a big event that was, you know, we moved suddenly over here. So we're concerned about how can we let our people know what the delays will be to get over to this side of the bridge? Sure, great question, and I'll, I'll try to answer it, and then I'll open up to possible any additions from the MDTA. Based on our conversations with representatives from the MDTA, our anticipation of when we're gonna see maximum congestion and delays is not in the earliest morning hours when we're delivering our participants to the start line, because the natural traffic patterns that time of the day are fairly quiet. Um, it's gonna be later on, mid-morning, 10, 11 o'clock, that you're gonna see the, the worst impacts. So the irony is you might be fine on your coaches, and those are who are arriving early in the morning. But what you might want to tell teams who, have, who are slated for times later in the day, 10, 11, 12, is I would encourage them to arrive an hour and a half early uh, just to make sure that they're not held up. And I don't know, Gordy, if you want to add to that. The delays are going to be probably in the airport. Yeah. Yeah, in particular, you know, the, and hopefully, um, you know, hopefully, our traffic later in the day, at least for your interests, are more affecting the westbound flows because all of our buses, two thirds of them will be heading back west. So our buses will be going back to the western shore during that time, but you're still gonna be down to one lane eastbound and that's gonna affect you um, until probably, like we said, two o'clock is our drop dead date. And, and hopefully we'll have it earlier for you, but it is gonna overlap with your event. So I would say 90 minutes, tell them to arrive, tell them to depart 90 minutes early to ensure that they get through the traffic congestion. Okay, any other questions? Um, how does the local police department, uh, sheriff's department, pl plan on handling the traffic on Route 8? Are they going to allow people to park on the shoulder as these parking lots uh, get busy. We have a facility within a mile of the Bay Bridge and we're concerned about people parking in that area. Okay, excellent question. Uh, two parts. First, uh, the question is related to parking along Route 8 and what steps the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department. I want to uh, thank John Hedinger from the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department who's been instrumental in our planning and a lot of the detail work around our finish area is designed to intentionally dissuade, discourage, and prevent vehicles from parking along Route 8. They will have a full complement of manpower out from the Sheriff's Department, supplemented with representatives from the MDTA Bay Bridge Police, and we'll also have a private security firm as well helping out in the immediate vicinity of the finish area so that we can free up the manpower for the Sheriff's Department. So they will be monitoring up and down Route 8. Um, we have the entire finish area barricaded with snow fence, specifically because we don't want to make it easy for someone to ditch their car along Route 8 and waltz in. So it's not going to be easy or convenient for someone to leave their car there, and moreover, it should be monitored throughout the day by the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department. If you have concerns specific to your your particular lot, I would contact the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department and specifically ask them to keep an eye on that lot as well, if it is a mile away. Um, my expectation is most of the people will respond to our invitation to park at Kent Island High School, to park at the Thompson Creek Park and Ride at the Mattapig Schools, because we have shuttles that pick them up there and drop them off conveniently right at the finish area. And it's going to be a lot easier than them trying to dump their car along Route 8. But uh, John, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. And again, it's John Hedinger, H-E-D-D-I-N-G-E-R, John. And he is our liaison for his department. Okay, any other questions? All the information you have on your site regarding logistics, um, et cetera, is there any way to get soft copies of that so maybe we could post on our sites or send to people directly? Yeah, uh, would you prefer it in like PDF format or maybe an image format? PDF. Yeah, I'll work with uh, Sparrow and I'll work on, on getting all of this information publicly. Some of it's already up there, like the shuttle maps and so forth. Some of the other information, though, we can put up there as well. And uh, you'll see a lot of information coming out next week on the traffic disruptions, including the traffic and uh, road closure statement that's posted in the back of the room. All right, guys. Hi. By 
what point in time should we anticipate all westbound traffic, both 50 and 18, to be backed up beyond the island? There's a Ravens game that day, and there's a lot of people that are heading to it. Yes, we, to know. Yeah, we are aware of that there's a Ravens game that day. And uh, being from Green Bay, Wisconsin, where, you know, football there, I'm used to life revolving around NFL games. And the unfortunate thing, and I, I direct the marathon that goes through Lambeau Field in Green Bay, the unfortunate thing with the NFL, much like the soon-to-be-announced schedule for the Naval Academy next year, is football schedules, unfortunately, don't come out that early. A few people did ask, you know, why, why did we schedule it on the same weekend as a Ravens game? Well, this date was announced in July of last year, and in fact, it was sold out by January. So it's been sold out since then. But to your point of, you know, when is it going to back up beyond the island? I guess to some extent that's crystal ball forecasting. I know from talking with Gordy at the MDTA, again, you know, mid-morning, 10 a.m., 10 a. 11 a.m. is expected peak congestion um, and then continuing on throughout the morning. So if, if you are going to the Ravens game that day, it would be a good idea to leave before 10 a.m., if not earlier. Yeah, and park in the long-term lot, right? Okay, so that's, I mean, that's the expectation, but it is, it is a little bit of crystal ball guesswork. Until we go through the event, you know, the first time, we won't know exactly uh, when the traffic counts will be at the worst, but based on our own traffic patterns and normal traffic patterns, when you add up those two numbers, that's when it's going to be worse, is 10 to 11 a.m. and then beyond. Okay, anything else? Otherwise, thank you all for your time and attention and for coming here tonight. Very much appreciate it. Oh, and Sparrow has something to add. And I see we have a representative from the fire department here. I just wanted to invite all of you to come and share in this if you don't have plans, if you're not going to the game. Or if you are going to the game, stop by the after party and celebrate. There are going to be four, um, four live performances, all from PRS artists. It's an Eastern Shore event, and we've got people coming from all 50 states and about 11 countries. And we want them to know what a wonderful county this is. So please join us, bring your families, and have a wonderful time. Buy beer, all the benefits go to the fire department, as well as some of the other vendors who will be there raising money for their causes. So we invite you all to come out. Have a great time, and you know what? We'll meet you here afterwards so we can get your opinions about what went right, what went wrong, and what we could do differently. So we want your input. This is your community, and we're grateful that you're giving us a shot to be here. Thanks.